You're currently in Palace 3. And the talk here is what security researchers need to know about anti-hacking laws with Marsha Hoffman. So. Thank you. And thanks for coming, you guys. I was not sure uh, how many people would want to come to a legal talk uh, since this is a conference that's about um, really cool stuff that's not really legal. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm Marsha Hoffman. I... Uh, uh, for the past seven years, I worked at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I recently left to start my own little practice. And um, I'm still a fellow at EFF, and um, uh, still do some work with them. And I am um, also a fellow, a non-residential fellow at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society, and I teach internet law at uh, University of California Hastings, which is a, a law school in San Francisco. So um, that's my background. Um, I wanted to give this talk because I feel like there's been a great deal of discussion about uh, anti-hacking law in the past uh, several months, uh, prompted largely by the tragic suicide of Aaron Swartz. And I feel that a number of people um, have been made very nervous about that prosecution and how it went down. And I wanted to give a talk um, to try to um, center the, the discussion a little bit more uh, on uh, the CFAA as it might apply to security research and what security researchers might find particularly um, uh, uh, interesting or uh, the, the things that really might come up in security research and what security researchers ought to know about it. Um, because, you know, I think the Aaron Swartz situation is really, is really awful and I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to have some reform of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that comes out of that. But... Um, in the meantime, uh, I think that we need to think about how to move forward um, and not be um, daunted by some of the legal challenges out there. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act very specifically. That's the federal anti-hacking law. And I'm going to first give an overview of what features of that law make it particularly problematic um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, the cases um, that courts have decided about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that might be especially relevant for security researchers. And some of these cases are ones you may have heard of, and some of them, I think, are ones that you probably never have heard of, but I think you ought to know. And um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about the lessons that we can draw based on these cases. So... Right up front, I want to be clear, I do not want to scare you today. My, my goal is not to uh, put you in a position where you listen to what I say and then you say, wow, well, I'm never going to do that research I was thinking about doing because that's just crazy. Um, I, my goal here is to help educate you and inform you about some of the potentially sticky situations that the law creates so that you can um, recognize them early and talk to a lawyer to help you navigate them. And I want you to be in a better position to uh, think proactively about how to design your research to avoid uh, running afoul of the law or putting yourself unknowingly in a situation that's probably not a good one. So that's the goal. Um, I want to be clear, this is not legal advice. Um, if you have uh, concerns about your research in particular, feel free to come talk to me. Go talk to EFF. We will uh, be happy to help you out. Um, in Q&A today, let's not talk about any of these specific situations. You know, come talk about, uh, about them privately with us later. Okay, so first, a general overview. We're going to talk about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Now, this is a law that was passed uh, originally in 1984 uh, in large response to the movie War Games. Basically, Congress, members of Congress saw this movie and got completely freaked out and said, oh my God, we cannot have that. And um, so in 1984, they passed a law that was actually pretty specific and narrow at the time. And uh, it basically said that you, you're not supposed to uh, gain unauthorized access to government computers or financial institution computers. All right. Um, but the problem is, since 1984... This law has been amended uh, time after time after time after time, and it's just grown bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, that has created uh, some, um, some situations that uh, are, are very unfortunate 
So um, here's the biggest problem with the CFAA. Uh, it has several provisions that, that are generally intended to sort of uh, criminalize certain types of uh, unauthorized access to various computers and what have you, but there's this one provision in particular that's really been kind of misused. This provision says that uh, it is illegal to intentionally access a computer without authorization or an excess of authorization and thereby obtain information from any protected computer. Okay, so, you know, let's break this down a little bit. Um, accessing a computer is uh, a concept that's been construed pretty broadly by the courts. You know, pretty much anything is access. Um, obtaining information, you know, basically if you view information, that's obtaining information. You don't even need to steal anything to run afoul of this provision. And a protected computer is uh, a defined term in the statute, and uh, over time, it's one of those things that's been expanded and expanded and expanded, so that now it covers virtually any computer there is, whether or not it's connected to the internet. Um, it covers your toaster, most likely. Um, interestingly, the way that Congress decided to define computer uh, does not include a calculator. So, you know, if you hack on calculators, you're pretty good. Um, you can just go, we don't need to talk about the rest of this. Um, so here's kind of the thing. The limiting principle is without authorization or an excess of authorization. This is the only thing that, that really gives this any contour or scope. And uh, this is a term that appears in this broad provision of the CFAA, but it's, it's, it's a term that also appears throughout the law. So um, it's, it's a, a defining concept in the statute and... Um, the way that we interpret this uh, phrase is very important. So uh, what does without authorization mean? It is not defined in the statute, and that is the biggest problem. Basically, Congress left it up to the courts to decide what it means uh, when somebody is authorized or not authorized, all right? Now, the term um, uh, exceeding authorization is actually something that is defined, and that's defined as to access a computer with authorization and to use such access to obtain or alter information in the computer that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain or alter. So that is um, also not very helpful because, again, it relies on this concept of authorization, but we just don't know what that is. We don't know what it means. And so this is, this is the main problem with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. We don't know what makes access unauthorized. Um, so what do you think? Does it, does it involve breaching a technological barrier that's meant to restrict access? Um, does it mean using novel or unanticipated technical means to access data that otherwise, you know, is free and open? Is it, is it a restriction on how you access data? <clears throat> or is it, does it mean that you're not allowed to access data for a purpose that the computer owner doesn't like? Um, these are all questions that have come up, and um, you know we're going to talk about how the courts have answered uh, these questions in uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So, some other notable provisions of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I've I've described to you the one that is the most problematic and it causes the most trouble, but uh, you know there there are others uh, that are in there too. Um, one of them uh, prohibits accessing a computer without authorization or in excess of authorization in furtherance of a fraud. And one of the reasons why that one is kind of problematic is because if you violated this provision, you've almost surely violated the other provision too, right? So at that point, you're looking at two violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act rather than just one, all right? Um, and uh, in this way, some of the, the, you know, the charges can start to stack up, okay? Another provision um, that is uh, something that security researchers ought to know about uh, prohibits intentionally causing damage to a computer without authorization. And um, that's very specifically by sending, um, you know, sending information or commands to a computer um, and, and damaging it that way. But also accessing a computer without authorization and causing damage or damage and loss. Now, the reason why I have those in quotes is because these are terms, again, that are defined um, pretty specifically by the statute. Damage specifically means any impairment to the integrity or availability of data, a program, a system, or information. 
So basically, this is disrupting service. Um, this is um, uh, this is destroying data. That's what this is. Loss is defined as any reasonable cost to any victim, including the cost of responding to an offense, conducting a damage assessment, and restoring the data program system or information to its condition prior to the offense. Yada yada yada. And so basically, what what that is trying to get at is um, if uh, you know any any cost that the victim of the offense has incurred in any way. Um, including as a result of having to investigate uh, uh, an attack or what have you, counts, all right? So um, the CFAA has very harsh penalties. Um, this is uh, a criminal law. It's also a civil law, which we're, we're going to talk about in a second. Um, what, this, what this means is that um, th the way that the CFAA is written at this point is even if this is a first-time offense, um, things can can really go badly. Um, as a general rule, the first time uh, offense is a misdemeanor, but uh, the statute will impose broad felony liability if the act is committed with intent to profit, if the information obtained is worth more than $5,000, if the act is in furtherance of another illegal act, or if it's a repeat offense. Now, if it's a repeat offense um, and the uh, provision of the CFAA that has been violated is the one that, that, uh, that we're going to be talking primarily about, which is the really broad one, um, the penalty is up to 10 years in prison. Um, now, if uh, the other, if, if um, basically the act is, is committed uh, without one of the other three uh, factors there, it could be up to um, five years in prison. And um, one of the, the big uh, kind of red flags for me here is this act in furtherance of another illegal act. Uh, many states also have computer crime laws. Um, some of them have language very similar to the CFA. Some of them have language that uh, is a little bit different. Uh, they'll talk in terms of uh, uh, permission or consent, but it, they all kind of boil down to the same thing, which is, you know, do you have authorization, permission, consent to access a computer? And um, in some cases, uh, prosecutors have tried to argue that, you know, you commit the CFAA violation in furtherance of violating the state law, which, you know, basically these things, you know, come down to the same behavior. And then suddenly you're looking at a felony rather than a misdemeanor. So that's one problematic aspect of how this is written. So there are also civil penalties, as I mentioned, which means that um, not only uh, can a prosecutor uh, uh, go after violations and um, basically send people to prison, but uh, you could also be dealing with a situation where uh, a private party gets upset and sues you civilly, for example, for damages or to uh, stop you from doing something. Um, so one thing that's important about this is that this creates precedent that applies also in criminal prosecutions. And that is a really weird situation. So uh, you know, if two private parties end up having some kind of a dispute and a judge is looking at it in that context and says, oh, well, okay, that violates the CFAA. That means that that behavior later uh, could also be uh, something that a judge looks at and says, well, you know, that court said that this violates the CFAA. Well, it violates the CFAA, so you can go to prison for that now. And um, we'll talk about how that gets to be problematic. Um, so something that I think is Im Im important and um, useful for security researchers to just be aware of is that... Um, to, to bring a civil suit, uh, the, the, the party who wants to sue has to have standing. And standing is this legal concept that basically says, you know, you have to have some kind of damage or harm. You have to have some, some skin in the game in order for a court to really uh, uh, be in a position to, to take care of the dispute, right? I mean, if you're somebody who's just not um, really involved in the whole thing at all, you don't have standing. The court's not going to listen to your to your arguments, right? So... Uh, a private party um, can have standing to sue in several circumstances, but one of them is if the private party has uh, $5,000 in loss. And um, because loss is uh, defined so broadly, um, any reasonable cost to any victim, including the cost of responding to an offense, yada, 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 um, I think that arguably, arguably loss could include the cost of having to investigate and fix vulnerability if it's brought to their attention. So uh, I think that that's just something to know about and something to be aware of. Okay, so 
let's sum up some of these problems that we have here with the CFAA. The first is that it's not clear what's actually illegal because we don't know what authorization means. And this vague language tends to lend itself to selective enforcement, all right? So, um, you know, basically, if everybody is doing things that might maybe be unauthorized, you know, police can kind of pick and choose and decide which cases they want to pursue. Um, the penalties are really harsh, so if you get the book thrown at you, you can really get the book thrown at you. Um, as I mentioned, civil precedents uh, are uh, applicable in criminal prosecutions too, which gets weird. And um, loss could be especially concerning for security researchers um, because of the standing issue. Okay, so let's look at how this tends to play out. We're going to talk about some of the cases and um, basically what they, what they can tell us. The first lesson we need to learn about this is violating agreements or policies is a big gray area in CFAA law. Um, and if you follow the subject, I'm sure that you've heard quite a bit about this. Um, the cases I have listed here are not all the cases that deal with this subject by any means. There are a bunch of cases out there, but I think that they kind of explain uh, pretty well um, the, the crux of the disagreement. Okay, so in the Citroen case, the one at the top there, this is one of the very first cases that raised this issue. Um, uh, there was a, a guy who quit his job, and um, when he left, he deleted the information on his work laptop before giving it back to his employer. And his employer sued him civilly under the CFAA, basically arguing that uh, when he was fired, his authorization to access his work computer had been terminated, and therefore um, he was no longer authorized to access the computer, and uh, doing so and destroying the data uh, uh, violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And uh, the court, uh, and, and, and he said, um, the, the guy responded, well, you never told me that. I didn't know. Uh, and so, you know, how, how, how was I supposed to know that? And the court basically said, you, uh, you gained unauthorized access, and the reason is because you had a duty of loyalty to your employer. And um, when, that, uh, when, you, when you lost your job, you violated your duty of loyalty by accessing the computer. And uh, at that point, it was unauthorized access. And so that created this line of cases that basically said that, uh, says that, you know, if you access a computer uh, in violation of some kind of a duty of loyalty, then um, you, have, uh, you have violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And there are um, several circuits now, several circuit courts that have kind of gone in that direction. Uh, the other end of the, of the debate uh, is illustrated pretty well by this case, United States versus Nozzle, which came out um, just last year. And in that case, there was this guy working for a company. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, that most of these cases tend to come up in, in these, these employment situations where things go wrong, right? So there's this guy, he's working for a company. He decides to leave and start a competing business. And he asks some of his former co-workers who are still working there if they will access um, the company's databases and pass along proprietary information to him to assist him in starting this competing business. And um, the, uh, uh, the company uh, had this uh, corporate policy that you are only allowed to access their computers and their servers and their databases for business purposes. Um, you know, to further their own business, right? So um, this guy was criminally prosecuted. Um, and basically, uh, the argument here was that um, these people, sure, they had authorization to access the computers to further the business of their employer. But when they actually um, uh, accessed this information with the intent to do something different, then they had exceeded their authorized access, all right? And... Uh, Nozzle said, well, you know, they were authorized. Authorization is authorization, all right? And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with him and um, said that we're not going to have a rule, we're not going to adopt a rule where um, violating some kind of a policy or some kind of a, an agreement um, is a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because uh, that would be, uh, that would create a really crazy rule. Right. I mean, there are employment uh, manuals out there all the time that say things like you're not supposed to access uh, your work laptop for personal reasons, but people still check their personal email. Right. And so does that make them a criminal? 
And the Ninth Circuit said, you know, we need to have some limitations. We're not going to do this broad reading that the government urges here because that would just create some um, really uh, sweeping uh, concerns. And frankly, it might be it might be unconstitutional, unconstitutionally vague, because who could ever really know what violates the law, right? Um, so now there are two circuit courts that have adopted that uh, line of uh, reasoning. And um, we were, those of us who follow this stuff, were kind of hopeful that the Supreme Court might take it up. Um, because there was, at this point, there, there is a circuit split at this point, And the law is different in different places in this country. Um, the reason why I think this is really important for security researchers to know is because you guys often work on things that have agreements attached to them, things like end user license agreements, and um, you know you might be investigating web services that have terms of use. Um, this last case I want to talk about, United States versus Drew. So you can always tell whether it's a criminal case or a civil case because if it's a criminal case, it's always going to be United States versus. Um, just you know, just FYI. So in, in United States versus Drew, uh, there was a woman who. Um, created a fake MySpace account and basically used it to um, harass a friend of her daughter's. And that girl um, very tragically committed suicide, largely as a result of that harassment, apparently. And, um, you know, everybody thought that was a really lousy thing for this woman to do, uh, obviously. And uh, a prosecutor in L.A., this woman lived in Missouri, a prosecutor in L.A. came up with this idea that they could use the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to go after this woman. And the theory was she uh, agreed to MySpace's terms of use when she signed up for the service. The terms of use say, among other things, uh, you're not allowed to supply false information. She created a fake profile. And at that point, her access became unauthorized. And so by continuing to use MySpace, uh, in violation of the terms of use, uh, she was obtaining unauthorized access to the service, and um, she had committed a felony. And um, the court in that case eventually said, you know, we can't have a rule where violating terms of use is something that you go to prison for. I mean, these are things that are unilaterally written by some company to protect its own interests. They can, it can change at any time. And how could people even know whether they're doing something that violates it? I mean, in some cases, basically, you agree to the terms of service when you visit the site. You don't even have a chance to read it before you agree. And um, we just we can't have a rule that's that broad. So that was a very good result. But it's the kind of case that makes me uh, that makes me a little bit nervous when you think about security research because you know you guys are dealing with agreements all the time. And so uh, you know one of the things that I would suggest that you do is read terms of service, read EULAs, read whatever, uh, whatever thing comes up in your research and know what it says. And if you can avoid violating it, don't violate it because it just gives them a club, all right? Okay, so the second thing. So this is kind of nuts. Accessing publicly available data has been deemed unauthorized access under certain circumstances. Um, the first case I want to talk about here, again, civil case, uh, civil precedents are really weird and crazy when you try to, you know, transfer them over to the criminal realm. Um, these were two competing businesses um, that uh, basically sold tours to high school students. Um, Explorica started up and um, hired some former employees of EF Cultural Travel. And uh, Explorica had this idea that they would try to uh, systematically figure out how to price their tours lower than EF Cultural Travel. And so um, they, uh, so, so EF Cultural Travel would publish on its website these codes. They were kind of internal codes that, um, uh, you know, if you had some, some background knowledge, you, you could figure out um, uh, basically how much a, a tour cost just from knowing the code. But for most people, for you and me, we'd look at that code, it wouldn't mean anything to us. Um, so one of the former employees uh, helped to create um, basically a scraper program that uh, harvested these uh, these codes, and then they were able to kind of figure out for all of the tours how uh, how how expensive these things were, and then they they could price their tours at a at a lower cost. And um, EF Cultural Travel sued, arguing among other things that this was unauthorized access. Uh, 
uh, for, for uh, among other reasons, because, you know, terms of use said something like you can't, you know, you can't scrape data from our site. Um, and the court in this case uh, tried to really kind of contain the ruling. What they said was, you know, this former employee who helped out with this, you know, he had this background knowledge that was useful. Um, he had signed an agreement, a confidentiality agreement, saying that he um, wasn't going to, uh, you know, he wouldn't do anything that would hurt the business interests of his former employer. So because that guy violated that agreement, then uh, accessing the data on that site uh, was unauthorized access. Um, I think it is worth noting, though, that this is just information that you or I could see. I mean, this was, this was stuff that was just on a public website, right? And that was unauthorized access. Uh, the other case that we're going to talk actually quite a bit about today is United States versus Auernheimer. Now, um, how many of you have heard of this case? All right. So uh, here's what happened in this case. Um, there was a guy, his name was Daniel Spittler, and um, he noticed that uh, AT&T had configured its, uh, some of its servers in a, a, a bit of an odd way. And uh, what would happen is, if you are an iPad owner and you were signing up for a data plan, you would go to AT&T's website. AT&T uh, would recognize the ICC ID associated with the SIM card in your iPad. Because you already have an account, they're able to connect that ICC ID with your uh, other information, including your email address. And so when you would go to their website to set up a data plan, they would show you a pop-up window uh, that's basically like, hey, sign into your account. And your email address would be pre-populated so that you wouldn't have to type it in, all right? Uh, but you would still have to enter your password. And so what Daniel Spittler realized was that the ICC ID of the SIM card for that device was displayed in the URL. And if he changed a number, then he would get a different email address. And, um, you know, he thought, well, that's pretty not, well, that's not very privacy protective. That's pretty terrible. He had been talking to some other guys sort of loosely about um, starting a security research firm. And he told them about this. Um, uh, one of them is a, a guy named Andrew Auernheimer. And uh, his hacker handle is Weave. And Weave said, wow, that's crazy. Um, we should see if there are any reporters uh, uh, who, uh, who's, okay, hold on a second. I, I missed one thing that's important. <laughs> Let me back up. So Spittler, when he realized that this happened, he wrote uh, a program to basically iterate through uh, possible ICC ID numbers and um, harvest the email addresses that would pop up that were associated with those ICC IDs, all right? And in that way, he collected... I don't know, roughly 140,000 email addresses. Okay, so he uh, tells uh, his, um, his friends online what he's done, and Auernheimer says, we should see if there are any uh, reporters in that list of email addresses, because uh, they might find this interesting, and maybe they would write about it. And they identified a handful of reporters, including a guy at Gawker, and um, they sent, a, 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 frankly, a rather provocative email um, to these reporters and said, you wouldn't believe this, uh, you know, AT&T configured its servers and leaked all this information, and it's ridiculous. And Gawker wrote a story about it. And um, then uh, the government uh, filed charges against Daniel Spittler and Andrew Auernheimer, uh, claiming that they had conspired to violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act by gaining unauthorized access to protected computers, and that um, they committed identity theft by harvesting those email addresses. Um, Spittler um, cooperated with the government, and um, Auernheimer went to trial. He went to trial in November, and he was found guilty on two felony counts. He was uh, sentenced to 41 months in prison, and uh, he was ordered to pay AT&T $73,000 to, um, to uh, uh, compensate them for um, their, their, the response they had to take uh, when they learned about this. Um, so, uh, Auernheimer's case is now uh, before the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, I'm on his defense team, uh, along with uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and his trial counsel, a guy named Tor Eklund, uh, and uh, Oren Kerr, who is a, a very well-respected uh, computer crime professor. And um, we recently filed our opening brief 
um, and expect the government's response uh, in a couple weeks, actually. Uh, so it's coming up. But, you know, this is another case that concerns me because this is a situation where AT&T made this information available on the Internet. It was hoping that people wouldn't find it, but then people found it. And, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, one of these situations where the argument is, well, they should have known. They should have known that it wasn't authorized, but there was no barrier there. And in fact, there wasn't even terms of use or any sort of agreement. So it was, uh, it was security by obscurity. Uh, people stumbled across it. And, you know, there's a guy now uh, serving, you know, a three and a half year prison sentence because of it. So that's just something that you should be aware of, um, you know, just because there is no technical barrier, just because there is no agreement, uh, doesn't mean it's, you know, open season, you should still kind of pause and kind of think about what you're doing and how. Okay, gaining access through unapproved, I'm going to say, technical means can present a problem. Um, the first case I have there, Facebook versus Power Ventures, uh, this is a case where um, uh, a little startup called Power Ventures designed um, a, a service where people could uh, sign into their various social networking sites and uh, view them all kind of side by side and um, uh, combine their contacts. And um, rather than using Facebook's API, what they decided to do was ask users for their login credentials. And then they would log in as the user using those credentials. Facebook said this violated their terms of service, uh, among other things, uh, and sued. Uh, one of the uh, interesting disputes in that case um, was uh, the fact that Facebook said, you know, we tried to block uh, users using this, uh, using this service, um, and um, we, we did that through an IP block. And uh, these guys kept circumventing the IP block. And so that made their access unauthorized, you know, in addition to the fact that they violated terms of service and stuff. And um, the court in that case uh, agreed that circumventing an IP block would violate, uh, actually it, it wasn't the CFAA, it was the California equivalent, which is very similar. Um, but yes, you know, the, 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 the California Computer Crime Act would be violated by uh, circumventing an IP block. Um, United States versus Lowson, very interesting case. Uh, uh, notably, uh, you'll see that's a criminal case. That is the same uh, district uh, that uh, Aaron, well, I'm sorry, that, that Weave's case is in, all right? Um, so in this case, there were these guys who were ticket resellers. And uh, what they wanted to do was buy tickets on Ticketmaster and uh, resell them. And uh, when you uh, go to buy tickets on Ticketmaster, uh, you know, anybody can visit the site, anybody can buy a ticket. They have you solve the CAPTCHA uh, to make sure that you're a person. And um, so, you know, everybody is supposed to, you know, type this in with their fingers or, uh, or what have you, and that's how you buy tickets. These guys wrote a script that basically allowed them to just blaze through the CAPTCHAs um, so that they didn't have to do it with their fingers. The government said that was unauthorized access. And um, I find that really problematic because... You know, that's not a situation where people are not allowed to access data. Anybody can access the data. It's the way that it's done, right? Ticketmaster wanted them to solve a CAPTCHA, and these guys didn't solve a CAPTCHA. And I consider a CAPTCHA kind of a speed bump rather than a restriction on how you access data. Um, but uh, the court said it is possible that that could be a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act violation. The other thing to think about is uh, Aaron's case, Aaron Swartz's case. Um, we will never really know how that was going to turn out. There was never a court decision. But we can uh, understand a little bit about how the, go the government was going to argue its case by looking at the indictment um, and listing the, you know, looking at the facts that the government thought were important. Right? Um, the government said in that indictment uh, that Aaron Swartz had um, violated community guidelines in the way that he accessed MIT's computers. Um, he, they, they said also that he played a cat and mouse game with MIT um, by signing up for a user account on the MIT network with a, uh, uh, with a pseudonymous email address and by circumventing IP blocks and by changing his MAC address when they tried to block him. Um, you know, I think that those are uh, obviously things that the government was going to argue violated the CFAA. 
So that's something that's worth knowing about as well. Okay, another thing to know. Merely creating a tool that could circumvent a technological restriction might be a CFA violation, all right? And we're going to go back to Facebook versus power here. This is the one um, that we spoke about just a couple minutes ago. Um, in addition to other things, uh, you know, there was a factual dispute about what exactly Power Ventures did here. Facebook said, we blocked them. They kept circumventing the IP block. Um, Power said, well, what you did was you blocked an outdated IP address that we were no longer using. So we never actually circumvented anything. Um, uh, there was an expert who testified that the service had been designed in such a way that uh, it could rotate IP addresses and basically just, you know, never be blocked using IP blocking. And the court said, well, you know, regardless of whether you actually did uh, circumvent uh, an IP block or not, you designed your service so that it could. And so that's a CFAA violation. So I worry about that. I find that very concerning um, because, you know, what that may mean, uh, you know, if adopted more broadly by the courts is that even if you design something, if you design something that could be used uh, to gain unauthorized access, even if you don't actually do it, somehow that's a CFAA violation, all right? Okay. Another lesson to learn. Public disclosure without reporting to the vendor first can certainly um, make the situation more tense, all right? Um, some of you may remember that a few years ago there was a situation at DEF CON where three MIT students were going to give a talk uh, about security vulnerabilities they discovered in the Massachusetts, uh, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority's fare system uh, for, their, for their subway. And um, M, uh, the, the MBTA sued and got an injunction to keep them from giving their talk. All right? Um, I think the fact that they were giving that talk uh, led directly to the lawsuit, obviously, right? If they hadn't been giving that talk, there probably wouldn't have been a lawsuit. Um, something else that's worth looking at is in United States versus Auernheimer, um, Daniel Spitler and uh, the others did not um, talk to AT&T at all um, about what they found. Um, we've went uh, directly to the press and I, I suspect the first that AT&T knew about it was the Gawker article, right? And, um, you know, I think that that was also an important factor in the government's prosecution. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that I think that talking about research is a bad idea, but I'm just saying that if you're in a tense situation, the fact that you plan to talk about it publicly may be something that kind of ups the ante, all right? So... Being a professional is something that can actually be used against you. Um, this is uh, something that I'm taking from uh, the trial in Weave's case. The uh, prosecutor's opening statement in trial, um, you know, he was kind of framing the argument, right? And he was trying to explain why uh, he believed that, that Weave did the things that he did. And what he said was, this guy was trying to start a security research business. And he wanted attention. He wanted notoriety. He did this because he wanted to do this stuff professionally and gain financially from it. So his motives were bad ones. And I was really amazed by that because I think that could be said of anybody who speaks at a conference, right? Uh, anybody who, publics, who, pu who publishes their research. I mean, of, of course you want people to know that you're good at what you do and you hope that you will attract business because of that. And to suggest that that somehow made his motives bad ones, I thought was a very amazing uh, insinuation. So um, I want to say just a word about port scanning because people ask me about it a lot. Uh, does port scanning violate the CFAA? So I wanted to kind of run it down and just tell you guys what I think about that. So there's a case, Moulton versus uh, VC3, a very old one in Georgia some years ago. Um, it's really kind of funny. Uh, there was a guy who had um, a, a computer, uh, uh, sort of a computer services firm and um, he was um, contracted to do some work for a county 911 center. And um, there was another guy who had a competing uh, computer services firm who was contracted to do work for the, the police department in this town. And um, uh, the, the first guy, Scott Moulton, was asked to set up a router uh, so that the E911 uh, folks could communicate uh, directly with the police. 
And so he's setting this up, and he uh, notices some things about the police department's um, network that he thinks uh, are, are, pretty, um, are pretty terrible security. And um, he goes ahead and does a port scan and, uh, because he's, he wants to kind of see exactly how bad it is. And um, the uh, competing company said, you know, whoa, you did a port, what is that? Why did you do that? And he's like, well, because I think you have some really bad security practices. That's why I think. And they got in this huge fight over this. And um, it ended up in this civil lawsuit. And, um, you know, he, uh, he actually sued them initially for uh, interfering with, uh, with business because, because of their dispute, he ended up getting fired, basically. Um, and uh, VC3 said, well, you did a port scan that violates the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, Georgia state computer crime law. And uh, the court in that case said, you know what, port scanning is not access and uh, it doesn't violate computer crime law. So that's how that one turned out. Another one worth just knowing about is United States versus Phillips. Uh, this is a situation involving a college student at uh, University of Texas at Austin who um, uh, did some widespread uh, port scanning and um, ended up uh, taking information from a whole bunch of computers, um, government computers, university computers, uh, just normal individuals' computers, and just compiling it. Uh, things like credit card numbers, all kinds of stuff. And um, the court in that case did not directly address whether port scanning is illegal, but it did note that port scanning violated uh, the university's terms of use, and uh, obviously he knew he shouldn't be doing it, and kind of as a whole, what he did was wrong. But, um, you know, for the one case that I know of that's right on point, um, it, it appears to me that the state of the law is port scanning is not illegal. Okay, so what can we learn from these cases? What, what can we use to help us out? The first is that atmospherics matter a lot, all right? Bad facts make bad law. So the fact that you, uh, that the people at this conference are people who work in security, um, who do this professionally, um, uh, I, I think that those are atmospherics generally that do help. And I, I understand that I told you about Weave's case and that was uh, something that really surprised me. It's the first time I've ever seen a case where a prosecutor's done something like that. And I think that on the whole, the fact that you guys are professionals and, um, you know, you have a high level of skill. This is all helpful stuff. Um, okay, you need to be careful about violating agreements or policies. And I think um, because of the Explorica case, be particularly careful about confidentiality agreements, all right, and private agreements that you have with your employer, for example, or your former employer. I think those are particularly sensitive areas. If in your research you want to sidestep any code-based restriction or limitation, um, even if you don't feel like it really effectively controls access to anything, talk to a lawyer first and think about how you can do it in the safest possible way. Be cautious about creating and distributing tools that can arguably be used to circumvent technological barriers because of the Facebook case. Your risk of getting into trouble or drawing somebody's attention in a bad way generally is going to increase if you write a script to access a computer a bunch of times, even if you have authority to access it once or twice, okay? Uh, just be aware that if, you know, scraping, crawling, that is uh, stuff that can attract attention in a negative way. Um, if you access sensitive personal information, proprietary information, financial information, that's a risky thing to do. And um, if you go public without talking to the vendor first, you know, I'm not saying there aren't situations where that's where it makes sense, but just be aware that it does uh, increase the tension in the situation potentially. You should just know that. Okay, so that's what I got. And um, uh, I'm open for questions. Uh, I also just wanna note that um, if you have feedback on this presentation, um, I would love to. I would love to. I would love to hear it. And so, if you uh, want to give feedback, please scan your badge in the back so that Black Hat will send you an email about it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, could you use the mic, please? Could you use the mic? Thanks. My biggest question is based on, on a lot of us that write code or write tools that do exploitation and basically to identify problems. I mean, even though we may take the, the necessary measures with legal 
based on, on the requirements, based on what we do from our, our confidentiality, most of our tools will do things that, you know, will basically respond within this act. And a lot of us are considered hackers. How do we protect ourselves? Because, you know, one court may see it as port scanning is basically not going to be a problem right. somewhere else. Maybe what about if I do a scan? And the scan may be based on the fact that I want to basically identify that this is a vulnerability that is affecting the masses, whether it's from an OS perspective or whether it's from a, a, a tool that may have vulnerabilities themselves. And even right. though you're doing the research, legally, you know, we've been challenged to how do we bring this to the masses? Because a lot of companies now have the ability that they have to report, oh, we have a vulnerability, we have a problem. This company saying so it puts you in a bind. So my question yes. is based on how can we protect ourselves even if we're writing tools for, you know, Backtrack or OWASP or anything within that nature? Yep. I, I think that's a really great question. And, um, you know, one of the things that is important to think about is um, there are a lot of gray areas here. That's just how it is. There's just some uncertainty. Um, and it's important also to realize that if you ever are in a situation where you are uh, having to explain uh, something to a judge, uh, you know, these are just people too, you know, and one judge might see something as being completely awful and nefarious and another judge might be like, that's completely reasonable, you know, that's fine. And um, two different judges could say two different things about the same situation, right? And so there's, there's some element of this that's just completely unpredictable. Um, and that's kind of the nature of law. People really hate it when lawyers say, you know, it depends, but it depends because basically we're we're all people and we're making judgment calls and, you know, it's, it, it's hard to predict and nobody can ever tell you 100% for sure that something is okay or something is not okay. Um, I will say that in terms of tools, um, the more a tool is a dual purpose tool, the better. Um, the more it can be used for good things uh, as well as bad things, um, the better off you are. If it's a tool that it's good for nothing but bad things, that's a bad situation, you know. Um, and I, I say again, you know, I think atmospherics matter a lot. You know, you're a professional. You are uh, somebody who does this for a living. And uh, that's a lot better than, you know, some kid sitting in his dorm room, you know, kind of just messing around. I think a judge would be a lot less sympathetic with that. Right. But who identifies a bad tool? How is that defined? Because yeah. most of the tools that we use, who defines the, the means of the, the exploitation is good or bad? Right, no. absolutely. Because a lot of the times if I'm going after, let's say, a network exploitation because I want to find out the vulnerabilities within it itself, who governs or what framework governs me or protects me that I'm trying to do the good, but yep. this could also be used for bad. So it, it now it weighs to the, the person that wants to do harm rather than the person who wants to do good. But then right. at the end of the day, the person who wants to go do good is going to be bad, you know, basically based off as a bad person. And that's where I'm trying to find the legalities where how are we protect it. Right. You know, if, if I do an exploit or I, or I create a tool, like, like for example, I've, I've developed for Backtrack. And, you know, one of the biggest things that we've had going forward is how, how we do protect ourselves from the masses of, of tools that, that it's used for. Yeah. Because it's, some people say it's, it's a Swiss army. You could do whatever you want. You could hack the world. But then you have the other component is that but we're not doing it to hack the world. We're doing it to research and understand what it's out there and how can we maximize our security to protect ourselves and our organizations. Right. I, I think it's a really good point, and I'd be happy to chat with you more about it a little bit later. I just want to try to get through some more questions, if Thank that's you. possible, because time is just short. But I'd, I'm happy to talk more about it. Let me resituate the mic here. Um, Quick question on uh, open Wi-Fi connections. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been kind of a lot of chatter, but it, I've never really seen. What, what do the courts think about uh, listening in on, on those types of connections, the data collection that can come from wireless connections that are unencrypted? Yeah. Uh, is there any sort of case law dealing with that? This is a big open legal issue that's being, uh, being considered by the courts right now. Um, so uh, a different law entirely applies to uh, communications. Uh, it's uh, called the Wiretap Act. And basically it says that it's illegal to intercept communications uh, if you don't have somebody's permission, right? Now, um, the federal law, there's a federal law and then a bunch of state laws that are similar. The federal law says that uh, you only need the consent of one party to the communication. And if you are a party to the communication, it could be you, right? Um, other courts say that you need the consent of everybody involved, all right, including California. Well, Google actually uh, got into some trouble over this because um, they, with their Street View vans, um, were intercepting uh, unencrypted Wi-Fi, 
Uh, and there's been um, a lot of litigation around whether that is okay or not. And actually, that case was just argued in the Ninth Circuit last uh, last month, and we don't have a decision on it yet. But you know, basically, intercepting open Wi-Fi might be legal, might not, be, might not be legal, and it might depend on um, the tools that you use, how sophisticated they are, or how like generally available to the public they are. Um, you know, if if something is a communication that's just readily available to the public generally that's okay to, to intercept that. But the question is, is this really generally available to the public or is it really only available to sophisticated people who have the right equipment or what? So there's, yeah, that's a huge, a huge legal issue right now. Sure. And it strikes me as one that will continue to evolve. The oh, absolutely. Service. I agree. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Kind of a two-parter. I'm a professor and so we always have this problem. Uh, one of the questions I have is writing queries to go out and pull social media postings and such. Mm -hmm. You know, going through the Institutional Review Board, as long as you keep it anonymized, they're okay with it. But from a legal standpoint, is that a, a reasonable thing to do? And then as far as protecting yourself from your students doing weird stuff, I use a form where I get them to sign off at the start of class that they won't, and I post the ethical stuff. Is that a reasonable approach? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the second part of it? I use a form, I have my students sign a, a consent form that they understand that in the class that I'm only teaching things to be used for protection, not for hacking. And mm -hmm. that if they do any hacking, I don't stand behind them and they're not, they don't have any protection from the school. Is that a reasonable approach to protect ourselves? What kind of professor are you? A university professor. A good one. But I mean, what, what <laughs> subject do you teach? Information security. Okay, information security. Well, you know, my thinking about this, um, you know, two very different questions, right? The first yeah. one, I think it, it kind of depends on the service you're talking about. I mean, Twitter, for example, is meant to be a publication platform. Right. And, you know, uh, assuming you don't have a protected account, your tweets are out there, right? Right. And, um, you know, I, I believe that these things are already archived, uh, you know, by the uh, Library of Congress. And um, I think a lot of people, um, you know, collect data from those tweets and I've never heard of any legal problem with that because that information is really out in the open. I've certainly never seen a situation where Twitter, you know, has gotten up in arms about people uh, collecting that data and using it in any way. Um, um, so, you know, my, my sense is probably there's, there's probably not a problem with that. Um, you know, as for your particular situation um, in your class, you know, I kind of feel like um, it's important to talk about ethics in information security. Um, I, I think that students need to learn uh, and decide for themselves how they want to go about their work. Um, and I, I think it's important to, um, you know, you mentioned that if they, if they do hacking, it's not cool. I mean, what does that mean exactly? I think that there's good hacking, there's ethical hacking, and I, I always worry that that's a term that really is so loaded and people often have such bad associations with it. And, and it's a shame because there's good hacking too, right? And I think it's important to draw that out and teach them about that. Okay, well, I do stress that they have to have permission before they go attack a, a network. I have heard in the past that the DMCA pretty much criminalizes any attempt to do security research on uh, copyright protection platforms. So, for example, if you were to publish a vulnerability found in such a platform, you would be in immediate violation of the DMCA. Is this correct or incorrect? So the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is a law that um, basically says you are not supposed to circumvent technological protection measures that are in place to protect copyrighted works, all right? There are um, exceptions to that law. Um, one of them is for reverse engineering. Um, one of them is for security testing. One of them is for encryption research. Um, you know, these are things that I think often come into play um, in, in security-related stuff. Something that's important to know about those exceptions is that they are not big wholesale exceptions. They're limited. For example, the security testing one only comes into play if you have the authorization uh, to uh, circumvent, all right? Um, the encryption research uh, exception um, requires that you make a good faith effort to get uh, permission to do the research, all right? Um, and the reverse engineering one uh, very specifically is limited to uh, doing reverse engineering to achieve interoperability between programs, okay? So uh, I don't think that it contemplates reverse engineering for security research. Um, so it, there are some things out there you might be able to use 
Um, one of the ones that I, I, a lot of people don't talk about this, but I think that they should. There's actually a DMCA exception uh, that lets you circumvent a technological protection measure if you're, uh, if you are um, accessing a device with the capability to collect or disseminate personal information about your online activities. And I think the idea there was uh, they wanted people to protect their own privacy. But I think that especially in uh, this, this day and age where there are a lot of people doing you know, mobile security research, there's something that could really be useful there, right? So you know, if you have particular research, you know, what I would suggest is talk to, talk to me or talk to EFF, whoever, and um, you know, kind of talk it through and see if some of these things might apply and might help you out. Hi. So um, with regards to network security, is there any case law or legal opinion with regards to active defense rather than passively stopping an attack, actually picking active countermeasures? Not that I'm aware of. I think that this is one of these, you know, the law is slow, you know, and this is one of these things where the law just hasn't caught up yet. And I don't, I'm not aware of a case on point. Okay, thanks. You mentioned uh, AT&T case uh, against Weave. Uh, and essentially how they had a, a web service that was designed in a vulnerable way. And certainly that's not the only example of such services. Uh, and you can look at even the Sony case uh, where, you know, they weren't following password best practices. They're you know, clearly kind of negligent. Um, what was the state of the law in terms of either civilly or criminally um, holding corporations accountable for creating such bad services or insecure software that, that goes against years of best practices? Yeah. So um, I am not aware of any court cases per se that address this, but the Federal Trade Commission actually has uh, pursued a series of uh, investigations and uh, complaints against companies that uh, do not have good security practices. Um, and uh, one that actually came up uh, is, that, that you all may, may have heard of um, involved um, a settlement they reached a few months ago with HTC. They basically said that HTC designed its phones to have really bad security practices and didn't patch and all of this, and that that uh, was uh, something that ran afoul of their authority to enforce. Un uh, uh, so the authority that they use to go after these sorts of things is um, uh, Section 5. It basically says companies aren't allowed to, to have unfair or deceptive trade practices, right? So basically they said this was an unfair or deceptive trade practice. And um, Chris Segoyan from the ACLU uh, has filed a complaint um, with the uh, FTC also to try to uh, encourage them to investigate uh, uh, basically mobile carriers and their failure to, to patch. And so, you know, I think that's the thing that's the closest um, in terms of direct litigation, you know, one party against another. I'm not really aware of much of that. But, you know, the, the FTC has taken an interest in, in security and have, uh, they've, they've really uh, cracked down on some companies that they feel have bad security. All right, this is going to be the last question. Hi, this is a question I get a lot when I'm working with developers or people who are not that familiar with security. They always want to know how they can get started, how they can um, learn more about it. And up to this point, my advice has always been you really don't want to touch it because of all the legal loopholes and just shenanigans you have to deal with. Um, is that the best I can do or? You know, um, I would encourage you to tell them that, I mean, there, there are courses, right? And also, I mean, if they're thinking about doing something, if they want to try something, if they're nervous, it, EFF is always happy to talk, right? I'm also always happy to talk. And so, you know, if, if you uh, want to direct them in that, in that channel, you know, I always think that that's good. You know, EFF likes to enable people I really hate the idea that people don't want to do certain things. They don't want to learn things. They don't want to uh, undergo or undertake certain research just because they're scared. And you know, I, I feel like the more security that we can give people, um, and the more support we can give people to make them feel like you know there are ways that they can do this that are going to be okay. You know, I think the better. So, yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.